catch up as needed. Oh, great. Thank you, Margaret. And we are also, as these conversations are going on, we have some side conversations naturally. Um, uh, today, uh, for example, Eric and I met with uh, Giuseppe Guarini, who is part of the Italian social co-op scene and picked up a lot of amazing, inspiring stuff. And I, you know, I'll, I'll start this session with what we learned from Giuseppe, which is that he, he was essentially saying, I think, this is my interpretation, he was saying, policy is important. The legal stuff is important. The corporate forms are important. But none of it matters if you don't have that field building done and you don't have the grassroots energized, you know? And I thought, I mean, I, I just thought it was so powerful because they've been doing it in Italy for so long and they do it so well. There's a lot to learn there. Anyway, so why don't we go ahead and we'll do that by letting Ali uh, remind everybody again about how Spanish interpretation is going to work. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes a todos, todas y todes. We have a commitment to language justice in this space, and all of these webinars are available in both English and Spanish. As a reminder, in the moment of speaking, please do be aware of your clarity and speed. Speak one person at a time and remain on mute when not speaking to minimize any sort of background noise. I'm going to go ahead and explain the instructions for accessing language, language interpretation at this time. Muy buenas tardes. Como dije, tenemos un compromiso con lo que se llama la justicia del lenguaje en este espacio. Queremos que todo el mundo pueda expresarse y eh, participar en el idioma más eh, preferido o llamado el lenguaje del corazón. Por lo tanto, probemos interpretación simultánea en inglés y español. En un par de minutos verán un globo terráqueo que aparece en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Al hacer clic en ese globo, pueden seleccionar el idioma en el que prefieren participar, si sea inglés o español. Si usted está usando un celular o tableta, las mismas opciones se encuentran en la, el menú de más opciones, donde están los tres puntos en la esquina. En el momento de hablar, por favor, que sean conscientes de su velocidad y claridad, que habla, hable una persona a la vez y que nos pongamos en mudo cuando no estemos hablando simplemente para minimizar cualquier ruido en el fondo. Con esto ya vamos a iniciar la interpretación. We can turn on interpretation now. Thank you. Okay. All right, great. Thank you, Alan. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is session number seven of eight. Wonderful. I see Minsun is here. Thank you, Minsun. Getting up early in the morning <laughs> um, and drinking tea, I assume, uh, to stay away. Uh, this is a wonderful group. Um, I, I want to say hi to Margaret Bao, who's here. Hi, Margaret. And uh, Tom Wellen and Candice are here from Shareable. Um, Remy, Ron, Laura. Grace, um, Isaac, lots of good folks here. Today is about um, policy, and we have two people. Mo Menklang, the policy director at the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperative, Cooperatives, is going to speak, and she's had a number of years' experience in this subject. And Alia Ned was kind enough to also offer to respond to Mo, and she is the director of government relations um, as most of you will know, at NCBA CLUSA. So that's a great combination. Can't do better than that. So, Mo, let me ask you to go ahead. And um, I think you're ready with your slides and so on. We're eager to see what you have to say. Hey, thank you so much, Elias and Minson and Rakiman Employee Ownership Center, just for having me. This is this is a really great opportunity just to get into some conversation and um, honestly, a really great learning experience for me. Um, you know, we're um, at the, uh, well, let me let me preface by saying, um, my name is Mo Klang. I am the policy director at the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. I've been with the organization for about, oh, seven and a half years now. Um, and, um, you know, I've had a little bit of a winding path by, towards like working on policy work. It was meant to be a small part of my job um, and 
it has like exploded really over the last few years in the worker cooperative space. Um, so there's so much demand and so much need and so much exciting progress happening uh, in the in the worker co-op space uh, with with policy and um, you know wrapping our brains around what that means as we kind of consider social co-ops and um, and like how that uh, overlaps is tangential is. Um, integral to the development of worker cooperatives in the country is something that we're really excited about uh, focusing on. Um, we had the privilege of having uh, Min Sun and um, Jerome Hughes come and talk recently at a webinar um, for the Federation just to do some of the level setting that I think we're doing in this kind of space, uh, this learning uh, series. Uh, and I'm very excited to have more spaciousness to the conversation because I think it's very important. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I still feel like I'm learning quite a bit about policy. I feel like it's always a, a growing edge for all of us as we um, kind of try to keep up with how the federal government is functioning these days, which I'm sure is not as fresh to anyone is quite complex. Um, and um, but today, you know, because we're we're talking about the future, we're talking about the theory of like what what kind of policies might we need. Um, and you know, my slides are are relatively high high level. I want to give some examples. Um, and I think to the point that Elias was saying earlier from your conversation with the Italian co-ops, like none of this is none of this is going to happen without support from grassroots, without a coalition towards doing it. So all of my slides are kind of housed in this idea of like. What, what is a policy that we need? And also like, what do we need to get there? Um, so you'll see that throughout the slides. So, and I'll make sure that these are shared so that um, if you wanna look at just the slides, you can look at those also later on. Um, I won't linger on this too much, but the, the Federation is, you know, we're a grassroots organization. So we're always kind of thinking about the grassroots um, and, you know, how, uh, but particularly for me, how policies and government relations work um, uh, interfaces with actual worker owners um, at the at like the business level, um, and our mission is to build this like thriving ecosystem of new co-ops, existing co-ops, um, and coalition building with um, solidarity economy movements to power movements for for racial justice and economic democracy. So, um, that's just a little bit about us. I would encourage you to. Uh, to check out usworker.coop if you haven't already. I know I, there's a lot of familiar faces in the room, but if you haven't, I'm always happy to, to talk with you folks. Um, and, and a little bit more about how we kind of come at this work is, you know, the, oh, whoops. Um, there's no end to like the amount of work that we can make for ourselves, right? <laughs> so at the Federation, we really try to um, focus on, you know, identifying challenges searching for expertise. A lot of times people, folks like, like Min Sun, like Elias, like Jerome, like in on this topic, um, you know, where I was looking for who who are the experts that can come and, and talk to us about this and talk to the Federation's membership. Um, and then amplifying those messages. So amplifying the idea, like socializing the idea of um, creating legislation around social co-ops, um, creating spaces to learn together. Um, and then just connecting community to the resources as they develop. So that's kind of the lane that the Federation thinks about um, entering this work in. And with that, I'll, I'll just get into it. And then hopefully there's a lot of time for questions and conversation, because uh, for me, I think it's most edifying to, to talk with, with folks about it. So, um, so what policies do we need? Um, this is kind of the, the array of topics that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, you know, there's messaging that's like, how do we how do we talk about what we're doing? And even before that, how are we defining it? Like, how are we actually defining co-ops, uh, social co-ops in this country, in this context? Because it's not a one-to-one, -one, right? Like, we have a completely different economy, a completely different history than Italy or anywhere else in the in Europe or the world. Um, so like how we define it within the context of the US economy is really important. Um, how do we study this, uh, uh, study this like both within the movement and also um, how, do we, how do we get legislators to study this work? Um, how do we create preferences for social co-ops? Um, 
How do we do the education around it? How do we incentivize it? And then at the end of the day, my personal favorite, how do we report on it? Like, how do we understand, how do we gather data and understand what we're talking about? So um, there's a little bit of an order to them, um, but but all of them I think are, are important in their own ways. Um, and just to underscore what we said earlier, you know, how do we get it done? We we can't solely rely on the government. There's there's just no way, right? Even if we had, even if we had um the best possible legislation that passed with flying colors unanimously through Congress, nothing will happen if we don't meet that, meet that offer, right? That nothing will happen if co-ops don't understand the legislation or um or or engage with it or take advantage of incentives that are created. So um, any policy really needs to be paired with like our discernment about what is actually best for our co-ops um, and collaboration um, so that we can learn together, grow together, um, refine together. Um, and uh, understanding the best opportunities is really important. And by that, I mean, you know, is there the, the secret sauce of having people who can concentrate efforts to move legislation is there political will? Is there a coalition of supporters? And most importantly, is there the expertise needed to actually think through um, the, the idea of legislation from all the different angles, like what might it mean? How do we keep ourselves from um, putting ourselves in a hard situation? You know, for instance, I think um, in a few different states, I'm sure people have run into this, you know, like for instance, New York, um, there's a co-op statute for worker cooperatives, and it's actually presented like quite a bit of like heartache and confusion um, for worker cooperatives that either aren't able to take advantage of it or it doesn't meet their needs. Um, and that was something that like wasn't foreseen. But now, um, you know, if we if we think about the idea of how do we update statutes or how do we create other alloys for um, different kinds of co-ops like LLCs or like how the field is developing, um, I think that that is that is just like a really important thing to to think about. And also just how do we use our time wisely, right? Um, we even if we had a huge coalition that was really amped and really excited about um, pushing forward legislation, um, if there is zero like political will to make it happen, then it is effectively spinning our wheels, right? <laughs> um, you know, that we can there's a lot of there's a lot of goodness about um coming into agreement as a movement about something before we get to talk to legislators. But um advocacy is very time consuming. And I want to make sure and I think it's important to note that like we should really use our time wisely and not uh try to push and push and push for something that's never going to happen because Congress is being wild. <laughs> so um thank you for the the chat. I love seeing an active chat. So please do um uh, keep chatting because I, I really like to see how any of this is landing on folks. Um, so if we're talking about the kinds of policies that we need. Um, you know, I, I, again, I try to keep this high level, but um, one of the first things that I think about is policies that study the idea of social co-ops. So sometimes, you know, funding, funding anything, getting money is something that is like, will almost always run into a barrier in Congress. Like getting new money is a thing that at the federal level and even at the state level is almost a no-go in almost in almost any scenario in this moment in time. But authorizing a study um, while requiring some funds is kind of like a lower cost way to get buy-in and socialize ideas. Um, for instance, in California, there is the Promote Ownership for Workers for Economic Recovery Act. Um, that is the, the Power Act uh, and that one is specific to California, but it uh, has created a study regarding the creation of um, co-op labor contractors. It's, it's basically like a study to understand how worker co-ops would work um, with in the contracting field sector. Um, and that has been going on, I think, for like around the last year. Um, and it's been a good way to get buy-in, get continued interest from uh, stakeholders, like, so that includes, like, people from the field, it includes uh, government, like, staffers, um, it includes legislators. So creating that kind of, like, buy-in um, through a study, it can be really helpful. Um, and that has to be paired with, like, 
our example, like we have to serve up examples um, that can be studied, um, our analysis of how, how useful or not useful um, or effective or not effective um, different worker co-ops have been, um, and also pointing towards thought leaders. So like, who are the people that we want uh, to, in, to get in front of legislators, right? Um, and I will also say, um, I know I just encouraged chat, but please also like, if you wanna raise your hands, I'm also happy to just like stop and like take questions throughout. Um, so next one is um, policies that provide education to the public and service providers. Um, this might be very obvious to folks, but um, the idea that, you know, by and large co-ops are still new to most of Congress. Uh, most people, most people, even if they are part of a credit union, shop at a food co-op, like most people just don't understand co-ops um, or don't know that they understand co-ops. Um, so we have to continue to educate folks. And, you know, um, Aaliyah does amazing work uh, with NCBA Clusa. You'll hear from her later on educating Congress on what cooperatives are writ large. We do a lot of work from the worker co-op specific angle. Social co-ops are another avenue to just keep keep beating the drum, keep getting the yeah, word cooperative in front of people. Um, but we have to pair that with cohesive messaging. We have to actually like have these conversations and these spaces so that we can develop a common understanding and messaging so that when we're talking, like what we're saying is in sync with each other. So if Elias is going and talking to um, his legislator and then like three weeks later, I'm talking to the same legislator that there's common language that we're reinforcing and not making things more confusing. Um, and um, and and yeah, I had a, I have a little picture here of SBA's website because they have a section on like choosing a business structure and like even like little pieces of education like this are really helpful. So on that page, it says like, you can organize yourself as an LLC or an S Corp or a C Corp or um, one of the options is cooperative. And just, you know, for the average American having a website that's like has the legitimacy through the Small Business Administration that says like co-ops are a legitimate option. That's really important, um, just just for general awareness. Mm -hmm. um, Eliza, I would or or anyone, I would love time checks because I, I feel like I I could probably talk about this forever. <laughs> so it's always helpful to know how much time I have. Um, so the next one is policies that provide education to the public, wait, did I? I just wanna make sure I didn't like kind of mess up my slides here. Um, oh, okay, so it was kind of like two, two parts of the same thing. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, the other piece of that uh, is the two service providers piece, because it's one thing to educate service providers, to, to educate legislators, totally different one to educate service providers. So like financial institutions, um, Accountants are a huge one. If you look at the co-op field generally, like especially the worker co-op field, there's so few people that understand co-ops that are able to like help people with their taxes, help people with like creating, like even if we had a social co-op designation in a as like a business form, if we don't have, if there are not like accountants that can help people do taxes and lawyers that can help people do bylaws, then it's going to be a big, huge mess. So it's really important to make sure that we have, um, you know, once we get things passed, that there are people in the field that are able to support that work. Um, and again, I just think that cohesive messaging just kind of goes in. And apologies, my computer is hard, <laughs> it's very slow. Um, and then the last kind of piece of this is trainers that will share that experience. So, you know, as we have, um, you know, like lawyers, accountants, like co-op developers who understand co-ops, having those trainers share their expertise and train other trainers. That is, that is like kind of the key to making sure that we, we do that. Um, and like, you know, I, I had a picture of here of Opportunity Finance Network. Um, because you know, I think through through relationships that I know a lot of the the finance institutions, the CDFIs um, that operate in the co-op sector, um, they 
just them being present in spaces like the Opportunity Finance Network and socializing, like the work that they're doing with cooperatives is very important for kind of expressing the word. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, we, we start, start to talk a little bit about definitions. So um, I think maybe Minson and, and Jerome, when they previously, I've heard them talk about social costs, we've talked about like requiring a certification uh, for for social costs. Like, what does that look like? Um, I have a little example here about the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, which is called FINRA, which is an independent, it has nothing to do with, it, well, it has a lot to do with the government, but it's not a government institution. But this organization writes and enforces rules for for brokers and 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 firms in the U.S., we need something like that for social co-ops and for co-ops generally. Um, because one thing, you know, like as we talked about with the statutes, it's um, it's kind of difficult to have the government be the ones that are the arbiters of what is a co-op or what is not a co-op. But this, I, um, one thing that I'm interested in exploring, and we're we're looking at this in the just in the worker co-op sector, is um, like can we can we be the ones that are certifying? Um, you know, we have a definition for worker cooperatives that has been vetted and agreed upon and passed by the membership of the Federation. So we're beholden to our membership and like that membership can, um, as it grows, can we can like bring in analysis that is um, applicable to the current moment, right? It can be inclusive of like LLCs. It can be inclusive of different forms like social co-ops that um that help to define the field by the field um whereas if you have a definition in the government it's it's really hard to get it created it's really hard to get it changed once it's already there so having this idea that there's like an independent organization that that is beholden to the field that can also um do certifications and have a rubric um that's something that i think we should be looking at um uh, policies that provide preferred status um, for grants and procurement. I mean, this is kind of a, a no brainer and I, I imagine it's not a surprise to anyone is, um, you know, having, you know, a, a lot of people have like a, a women owned, women business, minority owned business um, designation from the federal government, having a designation that is like for social cooperatives. Um, I know it's been talked before about before in this kind of social co-op space, but that's really important to have um, that preferred status so that basically like high road businesses like social co-ops can be preferred um, for a government contract, which is one of the best ways to socialize um, this idea. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we can have those uh, preferred statuses, but if we don't pair that with education for business owners, it's definitely not going to get us anywhere, right? So we can like fight for it and we can be really excited about it, but business leaders actually need to know about it. And it also, we also need to um, make sure that we're ready for that, right? Um, so, you know, I think people think about legislation as like a, this one track, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, oh, we're just working towards passing a bill, but that's actually like the, it's, it's very hard, but it's almost the easiest part because <laughs> uh, there's so much that comes after it that's like implementing the legislation or um, figuring out how it works. I know like uh, Margaret could probably talk like to no end <laughs> about like how how intense it is to um, after you get the funding authorized, getting it appropriated, getting it renewed, reinstated, um, any of those things that just requires um people to actually take advantage of it so that it is clear that um, that there's a need. So, you know, if we got a preferred status, if nobody took advantage of it, then it that just that it that proves a negative, right? It proves that there is no demand and we have to make sure that there's going to be demand. So um let me see. I think I'm getting towards the end. So I, I'm really eager to get to the conversation. But um I think similarly policies that provide tax benefits and subsidies um, you know, we have to make it worth it. I think, you know, um, when you look at the growth of ESOPs, a lot of it, a lot of the growth of the ESOP community really had to do with um, getting preferential tax treatments um, that made it, that made it very easy for business owners to say like, yeah, I'll sell to an ESOP. That makes sense. Because uh, I'm not going to lose money. I get to make sure that my business is um, stably owned by the people who work here. 
Um, and, and that status has really helped, help, really helped ESOPs to grow for a time. I think it's a little plateaued at the moment, um, but you know, we have to incentivize this idea. Um, it's not just gonna happen on its own and it's not just gonna happen because, um, because owners decide to, because it's not gonna be like magically all of these business owners just set, decide that they want to like convert a business to like a social co-op or something like that. Um, it really has to be something that um, that is intensified. So, um, and um, and then you know, kind of pretty obviously paired with education um, again for business owners, making sure that there's like widespread usage. Um, and then finally, again, my favorite one: reporting on the progress um, as so the Federation and our sister organization, the Democracy at Work Institute, we uh, do every other year a census of worker-owned democratic uh, businesses. And um, it's so hard. <laughs> it's so, so hard to do that work, um, especially when the federal government does a census of businesses. So wouldn't it be great if the government just did it for us and they they had to figure it out and they could use like the channels that they're already using to gather the data that they need. Um, getting the, making sure that the, that any legislation that we have is paired with, um, it has, has within it um, a, a section about reporting on progress that is really, really important so that we can analyze, so that we can continue our advocacy um, make them do the work so that we can really focus on the field. So um, let me see, is that the end? Yeah, that is that is the end of my slides. Um, that was quite a mouthful. I'm really excited to talk more. I really want to answer the questions, but I will check in with Elias. How are we doing? Do Should we switch to Aaliyah or do you want to start with questions? That was great. We'll, we'll hold the questions, give Aaliyah a chance to respond. But right. yeah, we're all buzzing with a lot of good stuff here. This is good. Okay, Alia, please please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Elias and Minsun and Rocky Mountain Employee Ownership Center and Mo uh, for leading us through this really thoughtful and much needed conversation and series as a whole. Um, just to mention, Alia Ned, Director of Government Relations here at the National Cooperative Business Association based in Washington, D.C., uh, so a lot of my time is spent directly interfacing uh, with members of Congress and federal agencies. Um, and as Mo mentioned at the top, uh, Congress has a lot going on right now, yet at the same time, a whole lot of nothing going on. Um, so leveraging those opportunities um, and the points that you made, Mo, are excellent on how to move the needle within this policy environment. Um, and I will keep this very brief, but just wanna respond to some specific things that you mentioned, Mo, um, particularly education, training, and you know, how can we harness our collective power within the cooperative ecosystem uh, to be responsive to the needs of right now, given that's the foundation of the co-op movement um, and the history within the US of Black and Indigenous communities cooperating amongst each other to formal structures that were popularized. Um, and right now, advocacy is ongoing, as Mo mentioned many times throughout. Um, and co-ops are still new to members of Congress, but there are some sectors who really had a lot of support and energy behind them with the federal policy scaffolding that allowed them to achieve scale and become well-known household names, even if folks don't understand the model, like our Lando Lakes, our credit unions, our Ace Hardwares. And so how can across sectors, we leverage that existing knowledge and scale that uh, the sectors I mentioned, in addition to rural utilities co-ops have achieved amongst policymakers, um, given this scale was only possible through this federal policy support. Um, and so there's existing knowledge and wisdom there and telling the story of co-ops at the individual level and the potential of how it can be leveraged within the uh, social co-op context is incredibly important as a part of the continued advocacy. Folks want to hear from people on the ground doing the work as a core part of that, and they don't want to see me say the same thing to a staffer or an office 
10 times in a row, but as soon as someone from a district or working in that community echoes that point and repeats that messaging, we see things move immediately. Um, and part of that storytelling is being strategic and using our time wisely, as Mo said, because we can often get pigeonholed within our individual sectors. So leaning into those lessons that are learned um, from others can be incredibly valuable and provide a broad-based coalition of support. Um, and data is another one that I just wanna touch on, which is key. Um, you know, there's some good points on for example, the USDA Ag Co-op Census that goes back to 1913. And we know that, you know, over the last 99 years, 75% of co-ops are older, uh, or 77%, excuse me, are 50 years old or more. 23% uh, are over 100 years old. So that level of business resilience that is inherent to the model um, can lean itself into generating that political will, despite the tenuous times that we find ourselves in. Um, and sort of seizing on that opportunity to show, here's what happens when you significantly invest resources to be responsive to issues. Um, and in terms of leveraging specific moments, we have some good cases and cases to be seen with, for example, 2025, which is International Year of Co-ops that provides focus, momentum, and opportunity for us to preserve, expand, and innovate on policies that empower co-op development, education, raising awareness um, of the cooperative model amongst policymakers at all levels of government. Again, very hard to get things done. I think someone else pointed out in the chat to stand up new programs, but where are there opportunities within existing initiatives and how can an ongoing conversation be leveraged to generate that political will within a moment through an existing opportunity? Um, so I just wanna say, please tell your story far and wide. Uh, that is the most important thing. Please tell cooperators. I think on day one, which was our impact conference here in DC, I learned or I heard someone say that cooperators are a very modest group. And <laughs> over my two years here at NCBA CLOSA, you know, I've seen that folks are incredibly modest because focused on doing the work on the ground, but telling our story is also important in terms of the advocacy space and throughout. Um, so I will stop there because I want to give ample time for a discussion, but just really appreciate the opportunity to respond um, and excited to get into the conversation. Great. Thank you, Alia. You know, what we might do is, uh, Mo, if there are questions that you spotted in the chat that you might want to pick up, or if anybody would just like to raise your hand, also do that. But I thought maybe we might just start with questions we've already got bubbling in the chat, if there's anything more that you see that you might want to pick up on, or anything that Alia just said. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I saw the question from Marianne about um, a right of refusal policy where workers or other stakeholders get first pick at buying companies. Um, I think it's definitely. I think I, I think the idea has been socialized enough that you know there it's it's possible. The thing that I most worry about in that particular scenario is making sure that a right of refusal is paired with um, a feasibility study or some sort of financial analysis of the business. Um, the thing that, you know, I, I'm most worried about, like, you know, if if a business owner is looking to sell, there's a couple different reasons. There's There's one where it's like, the business is going really well and I just want to retire <laughs> and I'm, I'm just done now. And, you know, that, that that's, I think, a, a great scenario. And, you know, especially one where there have been workers that have been there for a long time. Um, you know, right of first refusal will, cr I think, like it creates a scenario where there's a lot, there's a there's a big pipeline, right? There could be a really big pipeline for conversions to cooperative models. But sussing out which one of those are actually good ones is the thing that worries me. Um, you know, making sure that the businesses are viable, like, because I, very, I'm very concerned about the idea of workers getting saddled with businesses that are not good ones. Um, 
either because of like a lack of like if if it wasn't already cooperative then the likelihood that they were involved in any of the financial decisions or analysis or inner workings of the finances is like relatively low right like how much do most do most people know about the businesses that they work in um and the finances of them so that that's the thing you know like I, in, in theory and ethos like i i very much like the idea of right of first refusal but i think having make like making sure that there's enough education and enough transparency in the finances to make sure that people are buying into a good business is really really important i think yeah it's a really good point thank you um see i'm trying to look for any questions that weren't already answered in some way i don't know that i see any but i'm happy for somebody to draw my attention to one that i'm not seeing let's see maybe we might ask margaret to expound a little bit on her comment about preferential treatment that's an interesting question i'm kind of chewing this over in my head right now but Margaret, could you explain a little bit what you mean uh, in that comment? Yeah, and that's something that Margaret Lund has experienced about this in uh, in Minnesota, especially in the Twin Cities. I believe it was back in the 1980s. There was a state level housing program that gave preferential treatment to uh, housing co-ops. And so what happened was that a lot of developers said, oh, we'll develop housing co-ops. They didn't know a thing about housing co-ops. And the people that lived there didn't realize that they were suddenly in a housing co-op. And as to be expected, a lot of those, those so-called housing co-ops did poorly. And so it just gave a bad taste in everyone's mouth because these weren't true. I mean, there weren't systems in place in order to provide the education and you know and that type of thing so what what margaret has shared with me is that if you want to create you know that type of requirement require that the outcomes lead to democratic participation and ownership and and things like that things that yeah. a co-op would be best suited to do mm -hmm. rather than saying that you have to have to do these as worker co-ops or as social economy co-ops or, you know, what have you. Great. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That's such a great point, Margaret. Um, yeah. I think we, we talk a lot about like preferential treatment for co-ops, um, but yeah, I, I do think it's like a really increasing concern, like bad actors in the, mm -hmm. or, or just inexperienced actors, right? Inex um, sure. Right. Yeah. right. So, you know, um, I think a lot about, cause I, I think, Right now, employee ownership, I feel like, is in a moment where um, people are paying a lot of attention to it. And I, I see a lot of kind of investment companies like spotting it as like, oh, this is a cool new opportunity. And they are very much not a part of the worker ownership movement. And like they have little experience and they have little, little, if any, connection. Um, and that's incredibly worrisome. From just like honestly, just like a, a branding perspective, because mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've seen it already start to kind of creep into like people identifying, and because they have access to money and levers of power, that they get to like define a narrative in a movement that has already been going for decades, mm -hmm. um, and that that's that's a that's a really really good point, and and one of the things that I think. I will say, like, I really, um, why I do think the the piece about, like, how do we define co-op is really important and, like, what is the mechanism for doing so? Um, like, for instance, in New York right now, they have legislation around cannabis co-ops. There is a preferen preference for, um, for uh, worker cooperatives in that legislation. Um, and actually, we are, the federation is is named as, like, one of the, the ways to vet that so like we are actually um, certifying people just in the state of New York um, to verify like, yeah, this actually is a worker co-op. It's not some like weird shell company or something that's like not actually what it says it is. Um, and I think that that's that's like an, incre an incredibly important check. Yeah, yeah. But you know, especially, you know, as private equity firms, you know, start jumping into things like this, you know, how can we define what outcomes Mm -hmm. are optimal yeah 
this is a great point. You know, I don't know the details about the Italian context, but I have heard a couple of times that there is a problem in Italy with groups sort of pretending to be social co-ops and that they have a certification process, but apparently it's, it's not as rigorous as it needs to be. Maybe mm -hmm. this needs to be something like Mo's idea of a FINRA organization that could do that kind of thing. But it, it is true that if you, you know, create a new path of opportunity that has sort of a special privilege, lots of people are going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, that's us. Sure. You know. This is good. Other thoughts? Um, this is most speaking. I'm reminding myself of the language justice thing where if you're listening in Spanish, you actually don't know when people are switching. So I'm going to remind myself to say, this is most speaking. And uh, I see a question here. Um, is there someone to consult with a resource for community members currently working with legislators towards creating a social care co-op? What a great question. Honestly, I would point them to you, Minson, or Alliance. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then like Jerome could probably would be my first stops. Um, a little and, early for that conversation, uh, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Right. We, <laughs> we don't quite know what we're talking about yet. Um, other other thoughts here. Um, Mo again. I I mean I do think just generally, um, because uh. The co-op sector is relatively small when it comes to advocacy. And I think just knowing who people are, like uh, Aaliyah and I talk, uh, I don't know, like several times a week at this point, almost daily. Um, and it is, I think, really important to, um, to build upon the knowledge that we already have within the ecosystem, even if we're not, I, I'm certainly not an expert on social co-ops. I'm, I'm really committed to it, excited about learning. Um, and if, I'm someone that's already working it and like talking with legislators. I have a little bit of context for how legislators might like how information might land with them. So I'm happy to lend that piece of it. And then working in like hand in hand with folks who are thinking and like living and breathing social co-ops. Like that's, I think it's, I think it's more about like not one person, but like what is the coalition that we're building of expertise that are coming at it from different angles. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Mary. I'm sorry, I'm driving, so I don't know how to manipulate this phone. But I did want to respond to the comment from the person in Italy um, and the need to, for the grassroots. And I really think this is serious across the board of co op development is, um, you know, the education of the folks that we see ourselves coming into the co ops on a mass level before we start designing and building co-ops, assuming people are gonna wanna come into them. You know, the marginalized communities and formerly incarcerated and stuff don't know what co-ops are in any way. And um, so that mass education and building that grassroots movement, I would love to do a presentation in one of these sessions, but I can't do too much here, but, um, you know, what we're doing. And it's, you know, modeling after Erez Mandarati, the Antigonish uh, <clears throat> founders, and also, um, you know, Father McKnight, the founder of the Southern yeah. Federation of Cooperatives that started with grassroots, on the ground, adult education, after work hours with people <clears throat> to um, just bring to light what cooperatives are at all and what opportunities they can bring so people can choose uh, to be part of the movement or not. Um, and if we don't do that, these efforts will, won't succeed is my, my opinion. No. Cindy. Hi everyone. I'm, I'm trying to normalize image descriptions for our visually impaired. So my name is Cindy. I'm an Asian woman with, uh, long hair. I'm wearing brown glasses and a black v-neck. Uh, t-shirt and my black background is blurred. I'm in the very messy kitchen at home. Um, so I, uh, um, for, based on that, you probably can tell the disability advocacy is the center of my world. And I can see a lot of opportunity here. One of the reasons I turned to cooperatives is really seeing that as the most um, 
equitable path to wealth building and um, for the employees. And so as I'm seeing sort of um, in the in the ether worker um, movements, worker equity, I'm wondering how how when we talk about and build alliances, you know, um, related around that cooperatives in general and social cooperatives, how we might include the disability community in that conversation. And I also shared previously that there are systemic barriers that even cooperatives, um, I'll put it this way, that people with disabilities don't benefit from certain business models regardless. It kind of ties into a little bit of the question that I saw in terms of state advocacy versus federal advocacy and what the disability community has done on subminimum wage, which legally it's still federally legal to pay a person with disability below minimum wage. And so what the states have started to do and California was one of the leaders, that's where I am, um, is sort of cutting that pipeline off at the state level. So if you follow that model, there might be state advocacy that we can do and then leading to a federal conversation, but just two comments and Very good. Very good. This this is Mo. Thank you so much for that um, call towards like visual description, Cindy. I'm also an Asian woman with black hair, wearing a black v neck. <laughs> um, also in in a, with a messy background that is blurred out. <laughs> so, uh, but I really appreciate that that call. Um, so. I'll, I'll respond a little bit. I think feel like you you talked a little bit about, about um, like accessibility and inclusion, and then a little bit about the state and the federal. So I'll 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 talk a little bit about both. Um, I'm trying desperately to look up the name of. Um, there's a we we just had our uh, spring member meeting for the Worker Co op Federation, and um, as a part of that, we had. Um, one of our members talking the the name is escaping me right now, but um, actually talk specifically about this. Um, and what it, uh, their context was like all different kinds of accessibility, but um, the person who was speaking, um, they were speaking in American Sign Language. And um, it really, I think for for definitely for me and and I imagine for a lot of our members, it was really helpful just to remember like that there are a lot of different kinds of needs and and um a, a different like love different kinds of abilities. Um, and those exist in our communities, even if like, you know, we're talking if I'm talking about the worker co-op movement in the US, there's seven hundred and 12 verified co-ops and um you know like three of them serve uh deaf communities right that's still an integral part of it and they deserve a seat at the table um it, as we consider legislation and i think what, what i what that i was kind of sitting with as you were talking cindy was this i the idea of um the uh having our own like definitions and certification that is tied to the movement that makes sure that we include those people, right? <laughs> um, to include, to, to serve the, the most excluded among us, right? Um, I do think that's really important. And that's one of the reasons why it's, you know, it's the, like Margaret said, like changing regulations can be like a, a, a task on the order of decades. <laughs> and, um, and that's why it's important to make sure that um, we have, that we're we as a community as a community of people that are trying to push this idea of social co-ops forward that we are in fact uh being mindful of this different kinds of social needs so I, I think it's like making sure that we're always the arbiters of um of what this looks like um and it's not just at the whim of whoever is currently sitting as president or and like who their administration is, I think like building in long lasting systems that we can rely on are important. Um, man, that's gonna that's gonna sit with me for a long time. So thank you for that, Cindy. Um, I said I would add, Mo, sorry, it's Cindy again, is 
is I think the disability community is the most inclusive community. And it's my soapbox to say that we will all be part of the disabled community, either through the natural aging process. Um, the, you know, I'm, I'm the, I bring whiskey to parties for this, for this specific reason is I'm sometimes I'm the, I'm the bearer of this is what's going to happen. People. I just got to tell you, you will be part of the disability community either through, if you're lucky through the aging process, through an accident temporarily uh, or permanently and or very most likely as a caregiver. So that's almost a hundred million people. That's a third of the population of the United States. So it is not a small community and we all in this room belong to it in one way or another, whether you identify as so as not. So I think when I'm think when we're, I really appreciate your comments that keeping it mindful it's not a small community. It's one that we're all part of, but also it's the only community that is literally punished for wanting to work more because mm -hmm. of asset limitations and caps for wanting to save. Like I came to this community through as a caregiver to my daughter. Right now, when she becomes an adult, she can only have $2,000 in assets to her name. She can only save $150,000 through a savings account specific for her. That's only if she's identified as disabled by the age 26. So the majority of us will, probably won't be because only 6% of the population is born with a disability. So those are the specific policy systemic barriers that cooperative I think have a really unique opportunity to participate in solving is removing those barriers um, as we think about policy work. And I just wanted to be a little more, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak plainly on that. I wanted to be a little bit more specific in that area. And that's my promise of working in the social cooperative bit world. And that's my promise that I think cooperatives can have um, to a community. Yeah, that's good. I see Ricardo has a question. Ricardo, you wanna ask a question? You dropped it in the chat. Sure, yeah, no, it's, well, hi, everybody. This is Ricardo speaking. I do not have my video on. I'm cooking lunch right now before my next meeting. Um, and my photo is of me in a blue shirt looking handsome. Um, so hey. my question is, <laughs> um, the, just in this question of the federal policy and the state policy, I um, I'm trying to remember the legal um, what workshop or, or um, time that was held on on legal structures for social cooperatives. And as we're trying to navigate this in the United States, kind of the argument of well, a social co-op, the distinction between that and a and a multi-stakeholder cooperative or one of the distinctions is that there's a general purpose or social purpose that is more important than member ownership like benefit. And so if that's what a, so if that's how we're defining social co-op, um, then a nonprofit is sort of the most appropriate entity because then we can put that social purpose as the nonprofit's purpose. And then we can have these different membership or stakeholder groups that have democratic participation in running and operating that nonprofit organization um, and fig and then deal with the like income, business income versus nonprofit income, et cetera, stuff. Um, and so I'm just curious, as we look at the other models, like in Italy and other places, like I've heard that one of the most integral pieces of it is that there's this big tax benefit to social co-ops and so we're trying to reproduce that here. And that's also why we would use the nonprofit. So I'm curious how people are thinking about that. Um, and then um, in like, wh at what stage do we start doing this advocacy on the state and federal or yeah, state level to create specific legal entities or just like uh, Margaret was saying earlier, like just using the existing entities and then modifying them to meet these needs. Um, so that's one question. And then also just like wanted to lift up, um, Margaret, what you said, like creating incentives that are based on the outcomes that we want, as opposed to the entity for the form, um, because then we could, yeah, just wanted to lift that up. So just curious, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, that was, that's my my question and, and um, 
and I'm coming from it from a perspective of like, even when we do create new legal entities, it doesn't create like a boom of a bunch of new things in that, what, whatever that entity is, there's other things that need to take place simultaneously to like create that interest and, and things. So just, I'm curious what people's thoughts are on that. Yeah. Oh, this, one. this is Mo. Um, thanks Ricardo. And I'm going to cheat and say, a bit, kind of repeat back what I think Vincent and Jerome have already said previously, which is, um, that there is, I, I, I mean, at a very base level, I think get it where we can get it is, is something that's very important. Like there's varying levels of um, political will to get something like this done. And I think if, if at the federal level, um, I, I do agree, I think working within structures that already exist and getting like, um, like kind of refining that it could, it, it would be the way to go. Um, I'd also point to, I think I had a great conversation with um, NCBA's membership uh, director. Uh, uh, wow, Aaliyah, I'm blanking on her name right Pamela. now. Pamela. Pamela, <laughs> tell them um, And uh, about that, and, and I realized that she, that Pamela has an expertise in um, different like legal forms, which, and I, I really desperately want to um, bring her into the conversation. Um, but the, but, I'll, I'll caveat and say that like, if we, if, if the will exists at the state level, what's really important is being mindful of like different regulations in different states, creating a lot of chaos. So that's why starting at the federal level makes, makes a lot of sense because then it's uniform, um, mm. it's a lot easier to deal with, but at the state level, like, yes, it, there's a lot of like great things about like piloting and testing out. But the opportunity to create much more annoying chaos later <laughs> is like one of the side effects that could happen at the state level. So um, I know that Alea has some thoughts and that I also see Min Sun, so I'll, I'll make way for y'all. So yeah, I would like to hear more from Alea first. Oh, thank you. Min <laughs> Sun, and I just, Wanted to super quickly uh, pinpoint some of the that get it where you can get it, but also not understating the value that contact with your city and county officials has in terms of not only maybe piloting an initiative that isn't written into legislation at the local level, which brings into question the scale, but at least there's a proof of concept and then a second validator because every city official, county official has representation here in DC through the association world. And similarly, your city and county officials and economic development directors are going to the state legislatures who would then be responsible for those state statutes. So as many voices as we have singing from the same song sheet that can talk about, you know, that proof of concept direct benefits within the communities to amplify our messaging within the co-op and practitioner community. That is always a helpful place to go, um, but just making sure any federal initiatives are broad so that they can then be replicated and tailored to fit individual needs um, is just something to keep in mind, but I'll stop. Let me ask if I could go, should I go? Go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I think um, Mo, I think you uh, bring the very important uh, uh, perspective of starting it at the federal uh, levels. And also I understand how actually Alias think that actually local levels uh, might be a good starting point. Uh, I think both are right. Uh, but in, in our case, I think we need to actually uh, create our own case uh, we need to create a sort of the definition of, a, you know, the social cooperatives that will work here in the United States. And also, I think I really like uh, your point, Mo, about um, building our stories, right? I think we need to really focus on telling stories. Then where do we get actually started? Because there are so many different areas of social co-ops that we could
job opportunities for the most uh, marginalized uh, listening um, from so many groups. Just that's my just personal uh, uh, opinions. But moving forward, I think it would be really important uh, for us to really do uh, a little more study. And I know that some of you actually said, like, you know, how can we actually get more uh, kind of coherent message? And I think it starts with some sort of the uh, uh, collections of our stories telling of why actually we do need this social cooperatives in the United States. And we just actually have launched the uh, study groups and research team. So if any of you are very interested in being part of it, um, please contact us because that's kind of how we can actually move our things in a story, right, Kelly? Uh, Second, I'd like to actually talk about sort of the how we can actually uh, start organizing uh, at the local levels. Again, I know that it has to actually happen at both levels, but uh, it might be really interesting uh, for any of the city or, you know, California might be a really great state uh, to also explore, uh, explore this idea, but, you know, uh, kind of organizing more uh, coalition and groups to be part of these teams. Uh, without that sort of mobilization and organizing, uh, I don't know whether we can actually get so. So I think organizing uh, and then growing our coalition groups is the kind of a starting point of changing policy as well. Great. Thank you, Min Sun. Any other final thoughts? Just about to wrap up. Until next week, we have one more session to go. I, I should say, not only until next week, and then Thereafter, our community of practice, which we hope to start up soon after the last session so that we're not kind of closing all this conversation down. If you would like to continue with us next week, we'll tell you more about this monthly meetup, sort of replicating one, a wonderful one that we found in Australia, also about social care. And they are building out their social economy and social co-op structures, uh, partly around this community of practice, which is a good way to compare notes and so on. Any other thoughts? Tom, do you have anything? No, nope. are we good? Anyone else? Um, I. This is Mo. I just wanted to say thank you so much for Rocky Man Employee Initiative for having us. Thanks um, for the invitation to speak. I know this is precious time, so I appreciate being included. Um, also, we're going to be having more conversation about this, like in addition to the community practice, which I think is really important for this um, at the at the Worker Call Conference in September. So um, we're going to be opening up registration soon. So if you want to like talk in person about this, that will be really exciting. Min Sun will be there. <laughs> we'll be we'll be talking more. So um, the registration will be up soon. Wonderful. Cool. Okay, great. Save that chat, everybody for all these great notes. Thank you all for showing up and pushing in on this great work. We will see you uh, next week, same time. Thank you so much. Peace. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye.